If you have one of these blue Bibles that are scattered around the building, then you'll find it on page 593, page 593. Feel free to get up on your feet and go grab one from the back if there's not one in the seats next to you. And Sam is going to come and read for us from Psalm 80. Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before an Ephraim, Benjamin and Manasseh. Awaken your might, come and save us. Restore us, O God, make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smoulder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears, you have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbours, and our enemies mock us. Restore us, God Almighty, make your face shine on us, that we may be saved. You transplanted a vine from Egypt, you drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Its branches reached as far as the sea, its shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it, and insects from the fields feed on it. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the Son of Man, you have raised it for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Last week, for those of you who were here and those of you who weren't here, Johnny preached on Psalm 79, the one that goes before Psalm 80. And Psalm 79 flows, sorry, Psalm 80 flows from Psalm 79. In Psalm 79, as as Johnny unpacked it, there was a sense of a cry for mercy, a cry for justice, and a cry for restoration. And if you go right at the Psalm, end of Psalm 79, we get a great sense of anticipation, a great sense of the joy to come in the future when the call is answered. The last verse says this, Then we, your people... The sheep of your pasture will praise you forever. From generation to generation, we will proclaim your praise. But also, this is the big theme of the Bible. Justice, God's mercy, humanity, being at peace in a personal relationship with God. From the start of time, from the start of history, after humanity was separated from God because of the sin in the Garden of Eden, the greatest need of humanity has been a restored relationship with God that we were created to know and enjoy for eternity. Our ultimate joy as humanity can only come through hearts that sing songs of praise to God through a restored relationship with him. The lyrics of many successful songs are based on the heart. Soul music is an area of music that expresses deep feelings, longings. Through the lyrics, you get a sense of a singer's heart's desires, hearts that need to be retuned to have their longings come to fruition. And someone once said that the Psalms help us to retune our hearts, Hearts retuned through the truth of the Bible. Hearts that have turned back to God. Hearts that have hopes during time of despair. Maybe this morning you have walked away from God. Maybe the reality is you've never had a relationship with him. Perhaps this morning you are facing a tornado of chaos in your life. It appears to be out of control and you're being sucked in. Whatever the situation, let's listen to God. Let's have hearts retuned as we work through this psalm. Now, we're going to say a prayer now 
it's a little bit weird. We're going to have a quick prayer that, that God will do that in each of our lives before we open up the passage. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Father God, you know the hearts and the lives of everyone this morning. You know the situations of every one of our lives. And maybe some of us this morning where life is just chaos and we just, everything's out of control and we're being sucked in and we just don't get that sense of inner peace. And maybe there's those this morning, Lord, to, who don't know you yet and they hear about this Jesus and it's all a bit of a mystery to you and to them, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that as your word is unpacked, Lord, that uh, they will just see and get a glimpse of who Jesus is. Just retune our hearts this morning, we pray, or tune our hearts for the first time to your voice. Help us to be still, to listen, to hear what you have to say to us. Amen. Well, first of all, we're going to think about the reality of a life without a personal relationship with God. I'm not sure if any of you are wine experts, not the drinking type of wine experts, but the growing bit. I'm sure that for all of us, we know that perfect conditions for wine growing, I don't, I looked it up, are great fertile soil, good weather, too much rain and basically the the vines drown and the grape will rot, too much sun and it will cook them. But also the vine needs to have a ready supply of water. Often this water is unseen, it's below the ground, but the vine continues to thrive in the harshest of conditions. And as we work through these verses, I don't know if any of you have noticed, we find a a metaphor of of a vine, a picture of a vine that used to describe God's people. But also we find the picture of a God who provides for his people. A personal God, not a far-off God, a God who lavishes care, provision, and protection on his children. And yet, we find the grape growing, going bad. Why? When in this psalm, we find the disastrous consequence of a life without a personal relationship with God. And the background to this passage, as I've just said, is that God continues to love and care of his people. Using the the vine example that that I just talked about, if you look at verse 8, you find fertile ground. Verse 8 in Psalm 80. You find protection from the the predators that are going to get in and kill the vine. You find verse 9, all the dross is removed so that the vine can not only only survive, but actually thrive, but grow and grow fruits. Verse 11, we find great supply of water that never ends. In these few verses, we find a picture of a God who is personally involved in the lives of his children. If you are a Christian this morning, this is your God. This is not the picture of a God who is far off, who treats humanity with indifference, but a God who is loving, a God who is compassionate, a God who does everything possible to ensure that his people are protected, properly tended. And yet, in this passage, we hear that the fruit goes bad. Why? It is as if... And just broaden your mind so you think Disney sort of stuff now. It's if the vine says, I'm not happy with this plot of land and the care of my owner. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to dig myself up. I'm going to go and plant myself in that bit of land over there that I know nothing about. I don't know who owns it. It doesn't look particularly good. But I don't really care about the the provision and the love that that my owner provides for me. But the reality is, and look, it wouldn't be reality, would it? You can't get a picture of a vine digging itself up and walking away. Disney can do that, but you you can't get that. But if that happens, if it goes and plants itself in an area that's not under care and provision of its owner, who's the expert and loves it, it will die. And we get that sense in this passage with the reality of the God's people. They have walked away from him. God's protection as a result is removed you get a picture of broken down walls. Last week, Tori and myself, that's my wife, were on holiday in Cornwall. And we visited the Lost Gardens of Heligan. Fantastic place if you've ever been there. I haven't, I'm not going to plug it, but it was great. It was the only sunny day, but no, it was a wonderful day. And these gardens have been restored to their former glory. And in one area of the gardens, a greenhouse that have grape vines growing in them. And there... Located in a garden, it's surrounded by a really tall wall. 
They've been protected. The grapes are fat, lush, and juicy, perfect for the best wine. But there's a notice board next to this, these greenhouses. I love notice boards. If anyone wants to spend four days in a museum, which would take one, come with me. I read every notice board. But it shows a picture of what it was like before it was restored, this garden. Walls demolished. There was, there was uh, weeds growing everywhere. There was no signs of the vine. They were derelict and dead. And the picture is the same in this passage. Broken down walls. And you can almost sense the anguish of the psalmist as he sings out the longings of his heart, as the lyrics of his own soul cry out, Why? Why, God, have you allowed this protection to be removed? Why is the vine uprooted? As he looks back and sees God's personal loving hand of care in past history, as they were protected by God's sovereign wars, he now sees them removed. Listen to his cries of anger in verse 12, 13, and 16. This is personal. This is a talk to God. Why have you broken down its walls? So that all who pass by pick its grapes. Boards from the forest ravage it and insects from the fields feed on it. Your vine is cut down. He's talking about his people. Your vine, God, is cut down. It is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Why? Why has this happened? Well, the answer is sin. Despite God's love and care for his people, they've ditched him. They've decided that life is better elsewhere, independent from God's, becoming the God of their own lives. And often we hear the word sin, but it simply means saying God is irrelevant. Decided that we know better than God. Saying that we're the gods of our own lives. Living lives away from the reality of God. And historically we know um, the background to this passage, this was the reality of God's people. They slowly drifted away from God. On the outside they had heart, hands, uh, lives that worshipped God, but their hearts did not love God. They turned away from him. And slowly God's hand of protection was removed. The land that God had blessed them with and cared for them with and given them, they were removed, an enemy invaded, and they were removed away from that land. And you could sit there now or read this passage and think that God is an angry God. After all, verse 4 to 6 says, How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us, made us an object of derision to our neighbors and our enemy mockers. But these verses, but these verses need to be read in context with a passage, in context with a whole of history, God's relationship with humankind. The writer, in the detail of his psalm, takes great care to express the love God has for his people, the tenderness and care he shows them. This is a personal God who is active in their lives, and yet we learned his love was not reciprocated. God's people did not love him. The result, God removed his protection. Why? Well, let me try and give you an example. It's a really rubbish example. It's one I thought of as I prepared this. I'm sure of us and many of us are parents, or we're children. We are, of course, we've all been children. Some are children, some are growing up, um, or maybe grandparents. Imagine you're, we're walking along the side of a six-lane motorway. On the other side is the biggest M you have ever seen. For those of you who don't know, an M is the golden arches. It's the sign of McDonald's. Notice how McDonald's do that. They put signs by main roads. Yeah, that's ludicrous, isn't it? But imagine your child. All you can see is this M. And he starts to run towards that M. The only thing on their minds is the Happy Meal. The six-lane motorway is irrelevant. They are not aware of the life-threatening danger between that M and them. As a parent, what do you do? You don't softly say, there's a good boy. Don't do that. No! 
Stop! If they're near enough, a sharp tug on the arm. After the event, maybe a talk and discipline are needed to make the point clear to you. Danger! Stop! Your actions have serious consequences. Now, that child can react in two ways. They're going to have a hissy fit. They can throw a tantrum. You have deprived me of my happy meal. You kill joy. Or maybe after a quiet moment of reflection, young children do that, don't they? Quiet moments of reflection. But anyway, after a quiet moment of reflection, they realized that they would never have enjoyed a happy meal again if they had taken their initial sprint across the motorway. <laughs> their parents weren't killjoys. Far from it, they acted out of love. See, sometimes God removes his protection for a wake-up call to his people. God is totally unwilling to bring hardship on us. Of course he is. The idea of the wine grower is there for us to see the great love and care God has for us, personal love and care. He showers it upon us. But God cannot be blamed when we reject him. Perhaps when we continue to sin in an area of our lives that we know are against his word, he has made everything possible for us to know him. But sometimes he brings about circumstances, walls are removed to enable us to turn back to him. To, or maybe even to turn to him for the first time, from independence to dependence. Maybe this morning, as you, as you think about the circumstances of your life, maybe you see that you're not actually depending on God for peace, security, and real joy. Maybe that is your honest answer as you think about this question. Maybe you've tried, not literally, but to plant your life in other areas to find true satisfaction. Maybe you've even tried other religions, and, and when life gets tough and the going gets tough, they haven't given you what you need. They don't keep you through those tsunami days that suck you in. They don't give you an inner sense of being loved beyond compare. Maybe you worry about tomorrow because you haven't got that deep sense of hope, inner peace, joy, and security. Maybe your cry this morning is not like the psalmist, why, but how. How can I get this? How can I enjoy the very reason I am created? The meaning of life itself. How can I possibly have a living, breathing, real relationship with a God who appears so far off? Well, let's think about those questions as we consider God, the master restorer at work. I've been working, you know, I always bring construction into my talks, don't I? But I've been working on a construction project for two years in Newport. The building was well over 100 years old. It was full of rubbish. You know, in one of the shops we restored, there was a boat. Not a big boat, but a sailing boat. Somebody just dumped it there. There was dry rot everywhere. Walls were collapsing. Everywhere you looked was neglect, poor maintenance, bad decisions by the owners who said, I don't want to invest in this building anymore. They couldn't see the point of throwing good money after bad. What cost was someone willing to pay to restore the building to its former glory? Would there be a point in the building's history when the only thing it had waiting for it was the crushing ball? What about humanity? Do we sometimes look around the world, perhaps see the tyranny of rulers who appear to be getting away with things? Maybe cast our eyes around us and see the brokenness, the poverty, the pain and suffering, and think, is there a point in history when a line has to be drawn in the sand? The cost is too much, whether financially or emotionally. The damage is too great. Who is willing to pay the cost to restore this world to a place that we can enjoy to be at peace with not only each other, but with God? Maybe you've asked these questions. Is anyone too crushed and broken that God cannot save them? Does anyone see sin seem so great and so huge that God is not willing to rescue them? Can you or I ever be beyond forgiveness? Well, the answer is that God is the master restorer 
and he has paid the greatest cost imaginable to restore our relationship with him. Think about this in two ways. As we call on the master restorer, we call on the true shepherd. This song is a soul song from a man who is longing to see God's hand at work, restoring his people back into a relationship with God. And who does he call on? He calls on the shepherd. Hear us, you who lead Joseph like a flock. Psalm 80 begins where Psalm 79 ends, a focus on the picture of God as a shepherd. The term shepherd, as we've just shared, implies care, the flock coming under the protection of the shepherd. God protects from attacks, leads to good pastures, ensuring that we have provision and care. But it also implies that that the, the flock follow the shepherd because they know he is a person who loves and cares and provides. And as you go further into this psalm, the lyrics of the soul song call out more and more to the shepherd. Repeated themes in 3, 7, and 19 cry out, not only for restoration, but the shepherd's face to shine on his people, for salvation to be rescued. His lyrics run far deeper than a plea for things to be put right. The psalmist asks God not just to restore, but to turn around so that his face will once more shine on them. This is the beauty of salvation. God's life shine, light shining into darkness. When we turn our back on God, as we have, fit, have seen, he gives us the, the desires of our heart, which is to turn his back on us. No longer to have God in our lives. How do we get God to turn his gaze back on us? We don't. If we are lost and removed from God... That is our doing. It's not about us. If we are saved, it's God's work. It's God's grace. This is God's love in abundance and action. This is his mercy. Verse 14 sums it up. This is what happens. Return to us, God. That's God's action, not ours. Look down from heaven and see. God turning his face and and shining upon us once more, watch over this vine, coming back under the care and love of God. God, and only God, can bring his straying sheep back. We can never come to him under our own power and determination. Unaided, we don't have the will or the desire to turn back to him. But the amazing story of the Bible is that God turns to us. He reaches down to us from heaven to earth. He restores us. He saves us. The writer of the psalm knows that. And so what does he do? He prays. He prays to the shepherd of the flock. This morning, if you're a Christian and suffering, if you're a Christian or not a Christian who doesn't know God personally, Call out to the shepherd. Be honest with him. Reach out to him. Seek him. And the wonder of the Bible message is that he will reach out to you. He will wrap you in his loving arms. He will give you the relationship or restore the relationship that gives you ultimate fulfillment in life. Maybe this morning you're not a Christian. You yearn to have that peace, hope and joy. You, to enjoy the reality in the hands of a caring, compassionate, and loving God. Maybe your cry, as we've just heard, is not why, but how. How can you possibly bridge the unbridgeable gap between you and God? How could you pay the cost for your salvation? What do you have to do? Well, this leads us to our last point. Call to the master restorer, the one who counts the full cost of our salvation. As the psalmist calls out to the shepherd, we find the answer to his cries. It is the answer to the whole of history's need for someone to bridge the unbridgeable gap between us and God. In verse 1, the psalmist calls out to the shepherd. 
But there's also a picture of a king. All the way through, there is a sense that only the king has the power to rescue, to restore, to bring peace and joy and still waters. Who is the shepherd king? Well, elsewhere in the Bible, the New Testament, someone says this. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. God restores us. He saves us through the ultimate shepherd. The one who spoke these words, his own son, Jesus Christ. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Salvation, rescue, restoration comes from the ultimate shepherd who is willing to give up everything for me and for you. One preacher puts it like this, by the name of Sinclair Ferguson. When we think of Jesus dying on the cross, we are shown the length to which God's love goes in order to win us back to himself. We would almost think that God loved us more than he loves his son. We cannot measure his love by any other standard. He is saying to you and to me this morning, he is saying to the whole of humanity, I loved you this much. The cross is the heart of the gospel message. Christ died for me and for you. As he stood in the judgment seat, in before God's judgment seat, he has borne our sins. God says something on the cross which we could never do for ourselves. But God does something to us as well through the cross. As he shows you the ultimate cost, he says, this is how much I love you. On the construction project I mentioned earlier, a client did step in and the building was restored to its former glory. But there was a limit to what would be spent. Long complex calculations, which I was part of, I didn't do the complex bit, but long calculations were made to see if they were going to get a return on their money. How much was that client willing to spend? But at some point, the money was too much, and there may have been a line drawn in the sand. At the cross, the cost of all our sins were paid for in full. The only line was that the sand was the finished work of Calvary. When Jesus said, the ultimate redemption, redemption plan has come to fruition, it is finished. God did not see, sit there and do the sums and say, sorry is enough is enough and remove all of humanity away from his presence. That, in effect, is what hell is, being removed away from God for eternity. No calculation was required because God's work, love was willing to pay the ultimate cost to answer the cries of the psalmist and all of humanity. Be persuaded this morning. Like the psalmist, turn to the good shepherd who laid down his life for me and for you. Put your life in his hands. Maybe this morning you've walked away from God. You look at yourself and think, how could God love me? How can he possibly want me back? Be persuaded. Look at the cross and t turn back to him. Maybe you've never even acknowledged God existed. You've heard about him, but there's nothing personal about it. Be persuaded. Look at the cross and turn to him. There may be someone here today who has wandered away from their faith. Or someone who is in a dry and arid, lonely place. As we close this morning... Let me pray for you this morning if you are in that situation. That you would feel a restoration of God. That you would see his wonderful face shining on you once more. And feel the depth and breadth of his salvation. But there almost also may be someone this morning who hasn't received that. Again, I'm going to pray for both of those situations. But there almost also may be someone who's going through the tsunami. I'm also going to pray for that situation as we end our service. This part of the service. Father God, as I started at the start saying that you know each of us intimately, there is nothing that is a surprise to you. You know every part of our lives. 
You know, each of us who have or don't have a relationship with us, you know those who are suffering and broken. You maybe even know someone this morning who's sitting there thinking, how can God want me back? I had a faith years ago, but I've walked away. Well, a message to each of us is, be persuaded. Look at the cross. Look at the love that was poured out on the cross. Look at the finished work of Calvary. I pray this morning for anyone who's in that situation, they, they would look to the good shepherd, the perfect shepherd who laid down his life for them. Anyone this morning who doesn't know you, and, and to be honest, even sitting there this morning, this is all a bit confusing, and, and, and it's the first time the message may have been heard or really never really understand about God and Jesus. I just pray, Lord, that they will, that perhaps uh, uh, that... Uh, that confusion will drift to one side as they just home in on one thing, that you died for them, that you love them with a passage, that you, Lord Jesus, can be their good shepherd if, you turn, if they turn to you. And someone may be in a cold, a, a, a tornado of life at the moment. They may be your children, but they feel so lonely and just everything seems to be kicking off. Still them this morning, Lord, I pray. Help them to know that they are in the hands of the good shepherd who has them, who's not far off, who says, I am by your side. I have not only got you, but I've got this situation. Help them to turn to the good shepherd, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen.